In this video, I'm going to share with you what exactly I would do if I were to start street photography from scratch again. We will talk about gear, settings, workflow, how to share your work, what mistakes to avoid, and even how to find your style. Put simply, this video is designed to save you time and give you a strong foundation from which to carry on your street photography journey. Also, this video is sponsored by Squarespace, but more on them later on. Keep it simple. Get yourself a camera that you think you will like using, not one that's popular with YouTubers. After that, pick up a zoom and a fast prime. The prime can be either a 35mm full frame equivalent or a 50mm full frame equivalent. The 35 you would go for if you prefer to shoot scenes and the 50 I'd go for if you prefer to shoot people and subjects. Now if it was me I would get a Fujifilm X-T3, a 16 to 80 f4 zoom and a 35mm f2 prime. So in full frame terms we're looking at a 24 to 105 and a 50 mil. As for computer and editing software, I would go for an 11 inch iPad Pro with the keyboard and the pen, a 10 pound a month Lightroom subscription, and a copy of Affinity Photo. Also don't forget to pick up a few essential accessories, such as a wrist strap or a neck strap, a spare battery, a spare memory card, maybe a hard drive to back everything up on, and a dongle so you can plug all of that into your iPad. <music> the camera into full automatic mode. That means the ISO, the aperture and the shutter speed are in full auto. Now let's go over some essential settings that once you master, you can basically do whatever you want with your camera, even in automatic. First is set up your auto ISO. All cameras will have an auto ISO setting, which basically you're telling the camera, right, these are the parameters within which to operate the ISO. However, inside of that menu, again, most cameras will have an auto minimum shut speed. That's basically where we tell the camera, right, that's the minimum shut speed, don't go below that. So what I would do is set the minimum shutter speed around 1 over 200, set the um, bottom base ISO at base of whatever your camera is on the Fuji 160 for example, and set the maximum ISO at 6400. Now you've given your camera a set of parameters within which to operate and also reduce the chances of blurry photos in low light. Now let's have a look at exposure compensation. So for most shooting scenarios, leaving it at zero is actually gonna be absolutely fine. However, if you're dealing with very harsh light, we're talking about July in the middle of a desert, for example, um, set it to like minus 0.3 just to take the edge off it. If we're looking at a overcast gray day, plus 0.3. If we're looking at nighttime photography or low light photography, I can go down as low as minus one or even minus two in some extreme cases because the camera can overexpose, sorry, does overexpose at nighttime. And finally, if you're looking at snow or fog, I would overexpose the camera by around plus one, depending on the conditions. Now that we've set the base exposure, we now need to tell the camera how to interpret what it sees and how to expose. And that's where the photometry settings come in. Although cameras have a ton of different settings, we'll only focus on two today just to keep it simple. First is multi and the second is center weighted. Multi is, as the name suggests, looks at the entire scene and says, right, based on everything, the sky, the shadows and all that, this is the rough exposure you need. Honestly, I use that 70% of the time and it actually does pretty well. However, sometimes if you're shooting through something or maybe you're shooting out of a window, that's where center weighted comes in because then it only looks at the middle of the frame and doesn't look around the edges. So that way you can shoot out of a window but not expose for the window frame and blow out what's outside. Finally, let's have a look at focusing. Typically, I'll leave the camera on continuous autofocus simply because the things that I would shoot within a street always tend to move. And I would use two different types of focusing modes, so to speak. We have the single point and we have the zone. Or on some cameras, it might be called a flexi spot. So a single point is, as the name suggests, it's just one point on the camera. Wherever that point happens to be, that's only where the camera will focus. The zone or a flexi spot will be a particular area of the screen and within that area, the camera will acquire focus. My philosophy on this is that if I am still I would use the single point because it's a bit more accurate. Whereas if I'm moving, I will use the zone because it'll have a higher hit rate at the expense of a tiny bit of accuracy. 
You've got your camera gear, you have your basic settings dialed in, now time to get out and shoot. And let's break this down. First thing we want to look for is good light. Light, in my opinion, is everything when it comes to photography because bad light will make even the most interesting subject look dull and boring. So how do you find good light? Well, you simply look for natural contrast, be it on a sunny day or be it on a cloudy day if you're between tall buildings, and then you want to shoot either into the source of light or directly 90 degrees to the source of light because that will create the most cinematic look and it will allow the light to go around your subject before coming into the camera, thus giving it a more three-dimensional appearance. Once you've got your good light, now it's time to compose your image, as well as the usuals like your rule of thirds, leading lines, framing and foreground elements. Also look at the overall balance of the image. When you're looking at a photo, ask yourself, are my eyes looking where I want them to look? So if your eyes are looking at the sky but not at the subject, maybe there's a bit too much sky, so just crop some of it out, or maybe make the subject a little bit brighter. Generally, when you look at an image, you want to be naturally guided to the focal point, to the subject, and your eyes not rolling off to the side, to the top or to the bottom. If that's happening, chances are your image is out of balance and you need to crop or readjust to balance it out again. In terms of subjects themselves, well, as the name suggests, subjects are very subjective. My opinion here is just shoot whatever you like. If you live in the countryside and you like to take photos of horses, take photos of horses. If you live in London and you like to take photos of buses, take photos of buses. It doesn't really matter initially, just shoot what you like because if you shoot what you like, you will typically do more of it. Just because everyone else is taking photos of people smoking or people with their hands behind their back doesn't mean you need to do the same. Finally, you want to implement what I call the three photo method, which is basically when you get to a new location or a new spot, rather than just taking one type of image, try to take three types of images. The first one is a wide establishing, then it's a medium subject, and finally it's a tight detailed shot. The establishing shot will tell the viewer where you are, what's going on roughly. The medium subject shot will show the viewer something interesting within the scene that could be the subject, could be a person, a car, a bus, a tram, whatever. And the detail shot can be something unique that without the first two shots might not really mean anything, but when combined as a set, it adds a bit more context to where you are. Once I finish the shoot and I'm back home, typically I try and process my stuff as quickly as possible. I went through a phase where I would sit on my images and just let them pile up, and honestly that is the worst thing you can do from an organization and just kind of keeping on top of it point of view. I know plenty of people who just let their catalogs build and build and build without going through them, and then they get to the point where they just physically don't want to even touch the catalog because it has 10,000 photos that they need to go through it. When you're setting up your library, imagine you have 50,000 images you need to organize. Even if you have 50, just imagine you have 50,000 because the way you would organize a library with that many images will be different to how you would organize with only 50. And because you're gonna be doing this for a long time, you don't wanna get you know, a year down the line and realize that the system you've made for 50 images doesn't work for 5,000 images. And then you have to go through the whole ball ache and potential issues of reorganizing your library. So assume you have a ton of images, how would you go about structuring your library? Would you break it down into years? Would you break it down into countries, locations? You're the best judge of that, depending on how organized you are and how you like things kind of set up. But yeah, just think long term. The first editing tip would be to actually shoot RAW plus JPEG. Even if you don't want the JPEGs because you want to edit all your photos, having a JPEG gives you a rough idea of what the camera thinks that photo should look like. And at least initially, it will stop you from over editing because over editing is probably the number one biggest, let's say, mistake that we've all made when we started editing photos. Don't get overwhelmed by every single tool. Think of it of there's each individual tab, let's say in Lightroom, learn and master each individual tab on its own before then introducing something else. Because if you try and do everything at once, you will get so confused and overwhelmed that you might just you know lose track of what you were doing. So the two that I would start with is the general exposure sliders and the color grading. Oh, and one more thing, every time you make your own edit that you're proud of, save it as your own preset. 
because by doing that, you're creating the first building blocks of your editing style. Because with my presets, let's say you can buy on my website, they are like five, six years old. Okay, every year they might get a slight iteration, but ultimately they started out as me messing around six years ago and thinking, I like how that looks, let me save that. And then every time I edit a photo, I might make a few tweaks. And once they've gone through a thousand, two thousand iterations, you have a preset that works for you and fits your editing style and your photography style like a glove. Talking of style, let me give you a few bits of advice regarding finding your style. Now, this is something that's thrown around quite a lot. However, I don't think it's as simple as just editing and color grading. Your style will be a mixture of editing, lighting, subjects, locations, focal length, and even the environment you shoot in. Because if you're shooting at 35 mil in a big uh, European city, you like to shoot people who wear black coats, just for example, right? And then you color grade it a certain way, that's a style within itself. Whereas if you're complete, the complete opposite of that, that's a different style. The only thing I would say with that is to really fine tune your style, it takes a very long time. And you never actually get there. Because once you think you've got to a particular style, your tastes will change because you would have improved as a photographer. And then your ideal style has just now moved to a slightly different direction. So you never really get there, you're always kind of working your style, um, and it's something that you would keep working at for as long as you're taking photos. Another common thing people ask is, well, where can I share my work? So personally, I've tried a bunch of different apps, and if we're talking strictly photography, not TikToks, not videos, to be honest, there's only really three places that I would go to. Instagram is still king. Despite what everyone is crying about on Vero, Instagram is still the main platform for sharing photography. Now, many people are butthurt that they're not getting the same engagement they did five years ago, but again, it's still the main platform, so you will definitely want to have a presence there to share your work. Now, the other one is Twitter. It has really picked up over the last uh, year or so, and I'm certainly getting really good engagement from my personal photos on Twitter. Um, Obviously, there's a lot of changes going on at Twitter, and from what I've seen, there might be even more integration with content, so photos, videos, so I don't know where that would go. I would say because of how volatile it is, it's definitely worthwhile posting on there, because if certain changes happen that obviously make it a more photo sharing platform, then you're already one step ahead. Now, the final place is more of a luxury, but if you have you know, the spare income, Definitely make your own little website or your own little portfolio online. Not only do you have full control over that and you can have it however you want, but it is quite nice just to have your own little corner of the internet with your best photos that you can send everyone to. It's also quite a good way of sharing stuff. So rather than just having everything on Instagram or you know WhatsApping everyone your holiday pictures, just have them under an album of your holiday on your website and then send the link. At this point, I would like to thank the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. Squarespace is my main portfolio where people come to see my best work. I have full control of how my work is presented and interacted with. Squarespace is also the hub for my business, my newsletter, and my travel photography blog. Finally, I use Squarespace as my social media landing page and my digital business card. Whether you're a beginner or a pro, having your own website is never a bad idea. So if this is something that interests you, click the link below to get a free trial followed by 10% off your first purchase. Thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring and thank you for watching. Finally, let me quickly touch on some common mistakes to avoid. The first one is listening to everyone's opinion. If you ask 10 different street photographers the same question, you will get 10 different answers because street photography is a very uh, weird genre where people have their own preconceived opinions of what it means and what it doesn't mean. One group of people will tell you to edit your photos. Another group of people will tell you if you're editing, you're not doing street photography. Another group of people will tell you, well, you need to have people in it. Another group of people tell you, no, you don't need to have people in it. And initially, it can get confusing. Now, once you get confident in your own work and you know exactly what you're doing and where you're going with your work, you generally don't really care about anyone's opinion. But at least initially, um, try not to let other people's opinions sway 
the direction in which your photography is going. Now, I'm not saying ignore people who are more experienced than you, by all means take their advice on board. Just try and figure out when the advice you're getting is legitimate advice you can do something with, or whether it's just an opinion on whether to include people or not. The next mistake is rushing the process. Now, I know you might be very excited. If you got your camera, you want to go out, take photos, and you want to improve as quickly as possible. But honestly, photography, as I've always said, is a marathon. It's not a sprint. You're not going to get from A to B in a week. Maybe one in 10 trillion people might, but for most of us, you just won't. it just won't happen because it takes a long time of trial and error, of working out what works for you, what doesn't work for you, finding your voice, finding your style, and ultimately just getting better as a photographer. That takes time. So learn to enjoy the whole process of it taking that long. And that leads me on to the next mistake is not enjoying the process. I bang on about it so much on this channel and that's because if you enjoy the process of doing something, you will never get tired and you'll never get bored. Whereas for people who are only chasing an Instagram banger, when that dopamine hit of an Instagram banger doesn't come, and it will not come most of the time, then they get deflated. You know, whereas if they enjoy the process of setting up the camera, of packing your bag to go on a sunrise shoot, of actually going on the sunrise shoot, of being out there, of using the camera, of finding compositions, if you enjoy all of that, then you will never get bored. And having great photos at the end of the day will only make your day better. They will not dictate whether your day was a success or a failure. Okay, that's all for this video, but before I leave, I just wanna ask you a question, and that is, is there anything in this particular framework that you would add to? Maybe there's something that I've missed that you think a beginner who just wants a good foundation in street photography would benefit from. If so, write it down below. And maybe you are a complete beginner and there's something that's still missing. And if so, again, write it down below. All right, I'm done. So thank you ever so much for watching the video. I hope you're having a good day, a good week, and I'll catch you in the next one. It's sunny outside, I'm going to go out to take some photos and have a mulled wine because it's nearly Christmas. See you later. Bye.